Father God. Lord God, that he's breathing perfectly, Lord. Breathe your breath on him of life, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that his lungs and everything are functioning properly, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, Becky's sister, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for touching her right now, Father. There is nothing impossible for you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, as we speak to her life healing, Lord God, her mind and her heart, Lord God. We speak healing, Lord God, that you also touch her body. Lord God, we thank you as we continue to pray for people. Sickness is being gone in the name of Yeshua. Minds be healed in the name of Yeshua. We thank you, Lord God, for those physical healings, Father. The backs to be healed, Lord God. The hearts to be healed, Father God. Lord God, I stand on your word. We are your bride. You have given us the authority of the kingdom, Lord, to speak your word. And it will go forth right now through the blood of Yeshua. Lord God, we receive it right now. We receive it, Lord. People, wherever you are, receive his word. Receive what he says. Hallelujah. Don't let him torture you with tormenting uh, things of the mind. We thank you, Lord. Touch the minds right now. Touch the minds, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oppression be gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We stand on your word, Father. We seek you, Father. We are your people. We are blessed. If we're blessed, we cannot be cursed. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Yeshua. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. God's word is powerful. I mean, we've seen it. You, I, I know you've seen it. We've seen it. We've got to continue to trust in the word. Thank you, Father. I'm going to go on to our prayer shop. Thank you, Father. I just got so much in my heart. Like I said, I wouldn't be here. I'm here because I love the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. In other words, there's no other reason but being here is because we love him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You want to go ahead and, and do the prayer shot? The more and more we read these prayer shots, the more and more I get excited. The more and more, basically, prayers, it's the whole Bible. So the more we read it, the more I get excited. Our prayer shot portions were Numbers 22, 2 through 25, and then chapter 25 through 9. The half tour was Micah 5, 6 through 6, and then 6, 8. Uh, Brit Shah, Romans 11, 25 through 32. We're going to go and we're going to read Numbers 22, 2 through 7. There's just so much. As I said before, we can't cover everything. So we're going we're gonna to just let the Lord move and what he wants us to know tonight. Now Balak, the son of Zabor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorite. Moab was very afraid of the people because there were so many of them. Moab was overcome with dread because of the people of Israel. So Moab said to the leaders of Midian, This horde will lick up everything around us, the way an ox licks up grass in the field. Balak, the son of Zabor, was king of Moab at the time. He sent messengers to Bilam, the son of Beor, at Petor by the Euphrates River, in his native land to tell him, Listen, my people has come out of Egypt, spread over all the land, and settled down next to me. Therefore, please come and curse this people for me, because they are stronger than I am. Maybe I will be able to strike them down and drive them out of the land. For I know that whomever you bless is in fact blessed, and whomever you curse is in fact cursed. The leaders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the payment for dividing, came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balaam. Amen. Thank you, Father. Like I said, there's always so much we can't cover everything in just the time that we have. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Before I start, I want to say something else. I don't want you to look at me. I want you to meditate on the Word of God. I want you, don't meditate on what you think this and that is going on. Meditate on the Word of God. That's what we're here for, amen? To worship Him, to lift Him up. And you don't have to believe me. Seek God yourself. Seek the word. Know the truth, and it will set you free. Thank you, Father. So I want to start off with. We've done a lot of a lot of things on Balaam. Uh, we didn't talk too much about Balak, but we talked more about Balaam. But every time, it just seems like there's more to the message, and more and more and more. So I want to start off with a little history of Balak and Balaam, and it's gonna help us understand what's going on in the spiritual realm, and not only with this Torah portion, but also in our lives, because everything that we read teaches us about us, it's our life. So Balak's name means devastator. It means devastator is empty, it's wasting, it's a destroyer, it's dead, oppressor. It means robber, um, <clears throat> dealt, <clears throat> excuse me, violently. Balak was a destroyer. He tried to oppress, to destroy, and bring death to Adonai's people. That same spirit is still trying to destroy God's people today. But if we, if God be for us, who can be against us? And if we know, like I said earlier, our authority that the Lord has actually given us to move in, we can overcome the enemy. So we're going over this pair shot. As I was going over it, I was reminded by the Ruach HaKadosh how this world has bl been blinded by, by the enemy. And, uh, and also, how it, it, it just hurts because you see how people have been deceived and it has turned the truth around. And so many people have come to believe a fantasy and a lie. And if we believe the lies of Satan, the lies that he has brought forth, that evil and good are equal balance or of equal power, it's a lie. Satan has no power over God. So good and evil are not of an equal balance. It's not of an equal power. And if we believe it is, then you're living in a fantasy world, people. That's not what the Lord God says. Evil's destined is destruction. Revelation 20.10. Um, I think I'm going to read that a little bit later. But Balaam, now we're going from Balak, he was a king. Balaam was a, a, di a diviner. He was a soothsayer. He was one who professed to foretell the future. Prophet of evil. That's what he was. Speaking forth lies. Um, Brother Hunter read about Balak. He was a king of the Moabs. And he was afraid. And he joined, actually joined forces with his enemy so that they can come against Israel because they were afraid. They seen how Israel, God was with Israel and Israel overcame the giants and became the Og, overcame Gog and the Og, the giant and so forth. And they were basically unbeatable, but God was with them and they opened the Israelites and they overcame. So we have, we have heard, I don't know if you have, but I think most of us have heard evil versus good or Satan and God fighting each other, that evil forces fight against God and they can take God over. That's a lie. We're, I mean, it, it's a lie, it's a flat out lie. But movies and books and shows and all these different things, people keep saying it over and over, tells us that good and evil is God against God. Good and evil is not God against God. That's a made up thing. And a lie of the enemy. And, it, and those things fill our minds and we hear it so much and we see it so much. And it fills our hearts till our hearts become, that thing becomes real to us. And we might say, well, it's only entertainment. But it takes a root in people. That root takes place because many people don't know the truth. We even see it in our churches and denominations. And they are saying that evil and good fight God and Satan. They're fighting together to see who wins. What it, does that even make sense? How does Satan fight God to see who's going to win? Satan's already destroyed. God is holy. Satan is evil. Satan is not a god. He's a fallen angel, powerless to Yahweh. 
my way. Satan is only a god to people who make him a god in their life and follow his demonic doctrines. So there is no power struggle for Yahweh. There is only one God, hallelujah, that is our creator of the universe, the God of Israel. And there's no match for him. There's no match for our God. God does not have to fight against a fallen angel or anything evil. Who did we pick that up from? God don't have to fight no angel. He cast him down. Yahweh is not afraid of Satan. He's not afraid of evil. The only power Satan has is what we allow him to have through all the lies that he gives us and we surrender to it. Balak and Balaam both practiced magic. Both were influenced by demonic forces. They wanted to curse Yahweh's people, but they could not. Their fight was not against God because they could not defeat God. The fight is against Yahweh's people. We're the light of the world. So if, they, if the enemy can get us down, we won't carry out the plan that God has for this world. In this Torah portion, it was the people who allowed the curse, if you finish reading the whole story, the people, Balaam and Balak, could not curse Israel, but they cursed their self through their disobedience and lust. So if you read the story, you're going to find out that the only way that they were cursed was because they did it. They went to disobedience and they lust and they entered, um, they fell to the seduction of the Moabite women. So it's humanity who struggled between the spirit of the living God and the evil and evil. Balak was in this, uh, I mean, we have that struggle. We're going to serve God. We're going to not serve God. It's within us. And if we uh, serve God, people will, we get more. We understand so much more. Balak, the king, King Balak, was a magician. He was trained in a cult and magic. He worshipped Kamash, who was the, na the national deity of the Moabites and the Ammonites, which the Ammonites, again, they were a giant race. Hamash is an ancient demon that they made a god. He is thought to be a deity similar to Baal. And they may have been the same identity or the same deity as Molech. So Hamash also is associated with Ashtoreth. All these demonic deities of the nations worship as a god. And so we know we can see these signs and actions of ancient deities at work in the United States. If you remember, I mean, you see all these pagan idols put up all over the place, and in our, even in our um, White House area and uh, different places, you see them. Balak's name identified him or identifies him as a destroyer. That's what his name means. And he calls for Balaam, <clears throat> Balaam, who was a sorcerer, for help. Balaam was from the Mesopotamian area, which was extremely far from where Balak was. So how did he know? Balaam actually was a well-known sorcerer and he was paid for his definition and they called him from all over the world. He was one of those big shot um, witches at that time. So Balak, the king, calls for Balaam for help. Um, he was called a prophet. Some call, they called him, some say he was a prophet because he, he prophesied. Um, he was uh, he was what he was called a prophet because he contacted supernatural beings. He was not a prophet of Yahweh. And if you don't believe me, you guys dig into this and study it more. He was not a prophet of God. And when you hear the most of the time when you hear the word prophet or prophesy, we usually think it means a prophet of God. That's not always true. That's not always true. We read about Balaam prophecies or prophesying. And therefore, translating that, some people translate that because Balaam prophesied that he is a prophet of God. He may be a prophet, but not of God, not of Yahweh. He did prophesy God's word because Yahweh commanded him what to say. The Bible tells us over and over, Balaam was a sorcerer, paid for his definition. And we have that in this scripture, we have this in this portion, we have it in Revelations, it tells us the same thing. So I just want to go over a definition of a prophet. It's one who is in contact with a divine being 
and speaks on behalf of that supernatural being, serving as an intermediary with humans, a spokesman or speaker, and can be a false prophet, can be a heathen prophet. So being called a prophet does not mean that you're a prophet of God. We are even told in Revelations that Balaam taught doctrines of devils. Revelations 2.14 says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have some people who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to set a trap for the people of Israel, so that they would eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and commit, and commit sexual sin. Isn't he telling us all the way in the revelations is telling us what he is and what he did? <laughs> Balaam was a false prophet, like the serpent manipulating the people of, of Yahweh. If you read the parashat, uh, you can read about how the people brought that curse on themselves. And so basically, God tempts no man. Men are tempted by their own desires and their own lusts, and that's what the word says. There seems to be confusion because Balaam said he went to inquire of God what to do. True, but it was brought away in a deceiving way, the illusion to others that he that they would think that Yahweh was his friend and he communicated with uh, Yahweh as his God. It wasn't true. Balaam was a sorcerer and he was not allowed to do anything without Yahweh's permission. He had to get Yahweh's permission to curse God's people. Balaam had to bow down to God and accept what Yahweh commanded him to do. He had to answer to God for all he did. Let's give a, a situation, uh, just like the situation in the book of Job. How many of you remember about Job? Satan had to ask permission to attack Job. Job 2.3. The adversary came before God, the enemy, and having to answer to God. And God says, what are you doing? In my own words, he says, God says, you know, what are you doing? And the adversary of saints is walking about to and fro, seeking, basically seeking who I'm, I can devour. And God says, did you, do, uh, do you think, are you thinking, did you see my servant Job, an upright man, an upright man who fears me? And <clears throat> Satan was accusing Job for nothing. He was just accusing him. He's, he's telling God that God, he wants him to, to test him and see if this will happen, that he would, he would curse God. He was accusing God's people. God tells the adversary, you provoke me against my servant to destroy him for no reason. But you know what? God had a perfect plan for Job. And of course, we know that, I'll go over this a little bit more, we know that the Satan said, well, if Job, he's so perfect, if you touch his, his body and he gets sick, he's gonna, he's gonna curse you, God. And it's, obviously he's saying, you, I, no doubt he is going to curse you. And God, no, he knew Job. He knew Job's life. He knew Job loved him. And so in this case, God allowed the adversary to do what, what, what happened to Job. But he said, you cannot touch Job's life. And so God's ways, they're not our ways. Uh, they're much higher than our ways. Um, what Yahweh did was basically for Job's own good. And, and as, as we go on and study that, you know about it. 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, prowls about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's what he does. So, again, this is not always the case for all the situations, but for Job, hallelujah, Satan had to get God's permission, and God allowed it. In the situation of cursing Israel, Balaam had to get Yahweh's permission, and in this situation, Balaam was commanded not to curse Israelites. There's, there's a whole lot more in there. But we can also go to Revelations, where God also describes Balaam um, and what his destiny would be, because he was evil. Balaam was a false prophet, and the false prophet was thrown in the lake of fire. Let's go to Revelations 20. Revelations um, 2010. It 
it tells us that this is describing a false prophet, and Balaam was a false prophet. Revelation 20.10 says, yeah. Hallelujah. The adversary who has deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will they will be tormented night and day forever and ever. So we see that the false prophet is his destiny is already there. His destiny is already made. That's why he, he's been defeated. So where's the, the struggle between him and God? It's not. He's looking for us. He's trying to destroy us. So Balaam was, but Balaam, the sorcerer, was persistent in trying to change God's mind. If you go through the story, you read it, read it. Yahweh don't change, but he had a perfect plan. So he allowed Bala, Balaam to go to, to go to King David. And Yahweh was going to destroy Balaam, you remember the donkey and so forth, because his ways were perverse. But Balaam and Bala, again, uh, Balaam and Bala were so intense that they were going to do this. But God had everything in store. He knew what to do. He knew the plans that he had. And then we see Balaam and Bala, when uh, Balaam gets to Bala, they make altars to Yahweh. But Yahweh was not accepting their polluted offers. I think that's Numbers 22, 34, where you can see Balaam, he said the exact same words as Pharaoh did. When Pharaoh got afraid, he, oh God, forgive me, I have sinned. And then he turned around, but his heart was still wrong, still evil. And Balaam says the same words in Numbers 22, 34. Balaam told King Balak he could not do or say anything but what God basically forced him to do, put his words in his mouth. Balaam continued to try to bring evil on God's people, trying to change Yahweh or what Yahweh wanted to do or what Yahweh was saying, trying to find something to accuse God's people of. So Balaam could not say anything contrary to the Lord God caused his spirit, you know what it says, his spirit came upon Balaam? It's not like his spirit comes upon God's people. If you've ever dealt with a demon-possessed person and they try to talk, what did, what did Jesus say in Luke? He said, hold your peace and come out. So basically this is what was happening. God caused his spirit to stop and shut the mouth of Balaam. And it was because he was a symbol of the devil, the false prophet that would speak evil. In other words... Yahweh commanded the devil to hold his peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Luke 4.35, and Yeshua rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. It was a story about a possessed uh, person. Yahweh caused Balaam, the false prophet, to prophesy his words, God's words. And what would happen to Balaam and Bala because of trying to destroy God's people? Um, I think I'm going to read this. Brother Hunter, can you get Numbers 23? I think it's 7 through 10. And then we're going to do uh, 23, 13 through 14. What it says is Yahweh's word uh, about prophecy. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> like I was saying, when, if you've ever dealt with a demon-possessed person, I don't know if you guys believe it or not, but we have, I've seen it, it's real, and it tries to talk back to you. Some people talk with it, but I have no reason, I don't understand why, because I don't want to hear what they're saying, and they're lying. What's that, what, what, Pastor Bob, what was that one pastor said that was really crazy, where he was talking to a demon, and he said, what's your name, and he told him, it's something about lies. <clears throat> Oh, so he asked, the, the man with the demon, the pastor asked, or the person that was working with him, a question, and, and he told him, and then he answered the demon saying, are you telling me the truth? <laughs> what, what is that? How is he going to tell the truth? He's a liar. He ain't going to tell him the truth. Anyway, I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting that whole story not right, but <laughs> he asked him a question, and the devil answered, said, yeah, I'm telling the truth, but you know he ain't. That's crazy. But anyway, that's what I'm trying to say is um, if, if it 
tries to talk and tells you things, it has no need to. It needs to be quiet and it needs to listen to what God is saying. It has to, that those demonic forces have to listen to what God is saying. And we have the authority to tell it to be quiet. We have the authority to tell it to come out and quit dis uh, destroying people's lives. And in the first oracle of Balaam, this is what happens. The Spirit of God comes upon him, not because he's a, a person of God, but to shut his mouth. And if, if you keep reading those oracles, you'll see what I'm talking about. And tells him to shut his mouth, and he ends up prophesying what God's telling him. What's going to become of the evil Balaam and Balak, and what's going to become of Israel? Brother Hunter, you have a microphone? 23, which verse? Uh, Numbers 23, 7... 7 through 10. It's the oracle of God. It should be. Yeah. He made this pronouncement. Bela, king of Moab, bring for me Aram from, eastern hill, from the eastern hills, saying, Come, curse Yaakov for me. Come and denounce Israel. How am I to curse those whom God has not cursed? How am I to denounce those whom God has not denounced? From the top of the rocks I see them, from the hills I behold them. Yes, a people that will dwell alone, and not think it, uh, not, excuse me, and not think itself one of the nations. Who has counted the dust of Yaakov, the number of the ashes of Israel? May I die as the righteous die. May my end be like theirs. Okay, um, you guys are going to have to go back and study this, but what I wanted you to see was Balaam had to be quiet, and God told them, and he was repeating to uh, Balaam. Balaam was saying, you sent, in my in simple words, Balaam was saying to Balaam, you sent me. You came and got me from Iran, from that faraway place, from the eastern hills. You told me to come and curse Jacob, God's people. Uh, come and denounce Israel. And he's talking now, he's repeating, talking to Balaam. And he says, how am I to curse those who God has not cursed? And so he's, he's speaking to God's making him say this. How can I curse? How can I curse them? God has not cursed them. And those and, and those whom Adonai has not denounced. And then he goes and he talks about where God is seeing the people on the hill. They are separated from all the other nations. And he, he says he counted them as the dust of Yoko. That means... Jacob's people are going to be they're multiplied as the dust, as that was the um, covenant that was given to Abraham in number. So how are they going to die out? They will not die out. And then it talks about I die as the righteous die, and my end will be like theirs. And then I wanted to uh, let's see, twenty three. What does twenty three say? If we jump down. Twenty three says, "Thus one can't put a spell." on Yaakov. No magic will work against Israel. It can now be said of Yaakov, Yaakov and Israel, what is this that God has done? So, I mean, read those. It's amazing. Let's go to um, 23 and read I have to jump around because it's so much. Let's read um, chapter 23, I think it is 13 and 14. What's this, the second arm? I think it's 24, sorry. Here is a people rising up like a lioness. Like a lion, he rears himself up. He will not lie down until he eats up the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. When they lay down, they crouch like a lion or like a lioness who dares to rouse it. Blessed be all who bless you. Cursed be all who curse you. There's an oracle also in here. I think it's the third one. And it talks about how the people that are against God are going to end up. I think it is. Let's read. Um, let's read um, 24. And start with uh, 15. I think it's 15. So he made this pronouncement. 
This is the speech of Bela, son of Beor. The speech of the man whose eyes have been opened. The speech of him who hears God's words. Who knows what Elion knows? Who sees what Shaddai sees? Who has fallen, yet has eyes open. Open eyes, excuse me. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not soon. A star will step forth from Yaakov. A scepter will arise from Israel to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all descendants of Shed. His enemies will be his possessions. Edom and Seir, possessions Israel will do valiantly. From Yaakov will come someone who will rule. I stop there for a minute. I wanted to get to the point where he's even prophesying where I see, well, here we go. I behold him, but not seeing me, sir. Oh. That said, I behold him, but not soon. A star will step forth from Yaakov. A scepter will arise from Israel to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all descendants of Seth. Anyway, please go back and, and read these, and you're gonna you're gonna understand what I'm talking about. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it talks about the prophecy of what's going to happen to Balak and Balaam in the end, and how God's going to bless His people. So, um, again, my whole point here, too, is evil versus, evil does not verse God. There's no match for him. So, it's God's people Satan wants to destroy. If you read the story and read the other ones, there's more and more where it says um, he was after God's people. He's just trying to destroy God's people. But God fights for them, just like we see it in the natural here in Jerusalem. We see that Israel went to war, and, and what happened? We see that God fought for them. He, there was dust, I think, in the 1948 Israel, uh, when they became a nation, when they had the battle, that they were being overcome, but there's a big storm of dust that came and blinded the enemy, and they, they couldn't see the, Israel, the Israelites. But there's so many things like that, even now that we see the enemies after God's people, but God fights for them, just like he will in the end. It's not the veil of Armageddon, is not God fighting Satan. It's God fighting for his people. He stands for his people. You, you, you got to read it. <laughs> um, if you have any questions about this, please let me know because there's so much in there and it's, we're skipping over it. So it, it might not make a lot of sense until we put it together. So again, Satan wants to be a God and he desires man to worship him. So his evil power will allow him to rule and keep man in bondage. Satan is afraid of us. He's afraid of God's people when we are doers of his word and when we know who we are in him, we know who we are in God, God's word. And then because there's power and authority in God's word, we have to know who we are in him. When, when we are not being a doer of the word, we do not know who we are in Yeshua. Satan will have access, some, you know, Satan can have access to control us through our permission because we don't know the word of God. So we're destroying ourselves. We're allowing things to come on us a lot because of that. I'm not saying that's always the instant the instance because there's different things we go through, trials and so forth. But if we don't um, know who we are in Christ and we allow Satan to tell us things and we do what he says, we're going to hurt ourselves. When we know who we are in Yeshua and the authority that we have in Yeshua, Satan is scared again. He's scared of us. That's why he tries to bully us and he tries to get rid of us. He's tried to get rid of God's people through, since the beginning of time. He lies to us to keep us in bondage. Yahweh has given us, again, all authority over all evil. Luke 9, 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal disease. He's given us that authority and power. The Torah portion of Balak and Balaam basically is not them trying to destroy God because they can't. They want to, the enemy wants to destroy God's people. And as today, the adversary is trying to get rid of us, God's people, because we're the light of the world. We've given hope and salvation to the world. That's, that's our calling. That's what we're supposed to do. So there is no power that can overcome God. God's people are blessed. We cannot be cursed. The only curse that can come on us, on God's people, is what we allow the enemy to put, put on us or 
to accept what he does. And that comes a lot through disobedience and the lust of the fleshly mind. The evil versus good is not a battle of gods. It's not a battle of um, God and, and like it's portrayed in the movies. The battle is again with the humans. Um, Satan trying to destroy the humans and the struggle that we have within to serve God or the enemy. The battle is in the mind. And just something really simple, so maybe it's a little bit better to understand. When I first got saved, I went to church. I was sitting in the back. I was a teenager, and mostly I was made to go at that time because I was, you know, rebellious. And I was sitting in the back, and the Spirit of the Lord was calling me, calling me, because something was happening in me. And I really didn't know what it was, but I was being convicted. And God was calling me to him. You know, the Bible says no man can come to the Father unless he comes through Yeshua, through Jesus. And that is Jesus pulling them. That's his spirit calling them. That's when he's calling them. That's when the time is to come to him. Because, you know, we think, not, all, not everybody, but a lot of us think that I'll come to Jesus when I'm ready. You can't do that. You have to come when his spirit is drawing you. Because if you try to do it on your own, yeah, I mean, you can walk up there on your own. And if it's not in your heart, it's not going to be genuine. It has to be in your heart. And um, so you have to go when he's calling you. And anyway, I was being convicted. I was being calling. And the, I mean, this is, this is the, how bad and how in bondage we are. Sometimes we don't even know it. So I, I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up to the altar. And I went like that and I couldn't get up. <laughs> I went like that and I couldn't get up. And the Spirit of God kept moving upon me, moving me, go, go, go. And I tried. I tried to get up. Then I got up like halfway and I sat back down. I didn't have the strength to do it, but as I was praying, and I know that my mother had been praying for me, and I felt so strong. I said, okay, God, I want to change. I want to change my life. And at that moment, God gave me the strength, and I stood up, and I started walking towards the front, and my mother was sitting in the back. And I still was having a problem. So I told her, I said, Mom, I can't, I, I can't go to the front. And she said, I bet you can. And she took me by the hand and she took me up to the altar. The minute I walked up to the altar, I just felt water. The Holy Spirit just flowed through me and cleansed me. That burden just lifted off of me. And I and I just was so happy in my spirit, I can't even explain it. But this is what the enemy does. He tries to keep us in that bondage. And so it's that battle, that struggle that we have inside of us. We want to, but our flesh and what we've learned in our mind tries to bind us and hold us down from being free. I was free, people. It was amazing. It was beautiful. But that's just kind of a little bit of a struggle that I'm trying to say that we go through. And Satan is constantly telling you stuff. When you get saved, he'll come back and he'll say, oh, you're not saved. Look what you did. You're not saved. You can't be saved. And you fight with that. And if it's no, you have to stand on the word of God and say, yes, I am. And he's working on me. He's cleansing me. And I'm going to change with his help. But that's the struggle. And 2 Corinthians 10, 15, I mean, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring in into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we have to put on the mind of Yeshua. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. So the enemy cannot fight against God. He goes after us. And we must know that who we are again in God. We have to have uh, the mind of Yeshua to know the word of God, the authority that he has given us in his name to be overcome as Romans 8, uh, 8 37. We're more than conquerors. And I'm going to end with that. Let's read it. Romans 8. It says that we are more, hallelujah, more than conquerors. Hallelujah. And so this whole thing is we cannot be, we cannot be cursed because we're blessed unless we allow it to come upon ourselves. And the struggle, I mean, I don't know why we get this all the time. It's like, you know, there's a struggle between God and Satan. There is not. Satan's already been defeated. There, God has no problem with the authority over him. 
but it causes these things actually cause people to think our God is weak. My God is not weak. And Satan's already, he's already, um, his destiny is already there. So there is no battle between God and Satan. It's us that he's looking for. Yeah. So Romans 8, 37, but God has given us the authority. He's given us the strength, amen, to come out and be overcomers. Uh, 8, 37, no, in all these things, Hallelujah. We are super conquerors. The other translation says more than conquerors. Through the one who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers, neither what exists nor what is coming, neither powers above nor powers below, nor any other creative thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which comes to us through the Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. Does anybody have a King James version on this? You have it? I mean, I, I love this, but I'm on the Yeah, you have it? Or you can pick it up on the phone. <laughs> I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So nothing can separate us from the love of God no matter if it's uh, spirits that uh, the Bible says we fight against principalities and stuff, but we are overcomers. Hallelujah. Um, we read, I'm going to, I have to go back and read this. Uh, uh, Romans 8, and we're going to read 31. What then are we to say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He did not spare even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all. It is possible. Is it possible? that having given us his son, he would not give us everything also too. So who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Certainly not God. He is the one who causes them to be considered righteous, who punishes them. Certainly not the Messiah Yeshua who died and more than that has been raised. He is at the right hand of the Father and actually pleading on our behalf. He's our high priest. Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? <laughs> Hallelujah. People put this in your heart. Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Trouble? Hardship? Persecution? Hunger? Poverty? Danger? War? As it's not puts it, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are super conquerors. Hallelujah. Through the one who has loved us. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So nothing can separate us from the love of God. No death. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So praise God. Hallelujah. People were more than conquerors. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Tomorrow we have some guest speakers and Brother Hunter's going to give us more information on it. But if you can be here, I'm telling you, God's going to move. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, Carrie, uh, what's his, what was the high pronounced last name? Efer. Efer was delivered from a mental institution. Come on. The enemy has no power over God. And then, and, you know, if you want God, you're going to get it. And uh, Billy Langer, he was put in prison for murder. God delivered him, brought him out, healed his heart, for him to help his family and so forth. And then uh, Debbie Erford will be with the women. I'm telling you, God is powerful. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, people. Nothing, nothing. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So we're going to um we're gonna pray again. And we're gonna pray for tomorrow. Thank you, Father. Lord God, we thank you, Father. Hallelujah, Father God, we love you, Lord. Lord, we're here because we desire you, Father God. We want more of you, Father God. We want to walk, Lord God, in your ways, Father God. We want to declare your word, Lord God, to people's lives and to our lives, Lord God. We thank you that nothing can separate us from you, Lord God. No sicknesses, Lord God, can separate us from you, Father. No problems can separate us from you, Lord God. Lord God, you can work in marriages, Father God. You can change it, Lord God. Lord God, you can be the head, Lord God, that your love will flow through that family, through the uh, spouses and the children, Father God, giving them victory over this world, Lord God, the lies of the enemy. We thank you, Lord, as we have victory over sicknesses, Lord God, as we cast them out in your name, Father, and we believe and trust in you, Father. Without doubt, Father, you said only believe all things are possible, Father. Help us, Lord God, to understand the authority that you have given us through your word, Father God, to help, Lord God, and to bring the truth, Lord God, to bring the gospel, Father. We thank you, Father, as you bless your people here today, Father. Thank you, Lord, as they pray with each other, Lord God, their families, Lord God, and friends, Father. Thank you, Lord, as we believe, Lord God, that bondages are all broken, Father, and that you are doing great and mighty things, Father. We don't have to wait till tomorrow, Father. We can we can ask right now and receive in your name, Father. If we have that desire, change our hearts, Lord. Have us, help us, Lord God, to have a desire after you, Father, for your coming soon. Your coming soon, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you, Father. Hallelujah, thank you, Father. Bless your people, Lord God. Lord God, they will not be burdened or, or over, uh, have anxiety or, or anything, Lord God, over different things that are happening, Lord God. If we just put our trust in you, that you'll give us that shalom, Father, because you know all things, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I'm going to uh, say the priestly blessing. Yavarecha Adonai v'yesh manecha. Yael Adonai pana elecha v'yecha. Isa Adonai pana elecha v'yakshim lecha shalom. We will not bless you. We will not keep you. We will not make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. We will not lift up his countenance upon you. Thank you, Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you again, Father God, for your shalom, Father. Thank you again, Father God, for helping your people, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for all bondages to be broken. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated, and Brother Hunter's just going to give a few announcements. And I want to mention, if you have any offering here, you can see Pastor Bob, and I um, appreciate it. Hallelujah. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Just a few announcements. Uh, of course, tomorrow, uh, beginning at 10 a.m., right here, uh, we're going to be having the men's and women's conferences. Now, Rabbi I mentioned a few of the speakers, uh, just to review, uh, Billy Lanier, uh, who is a, a testimony from a former convict, uh, Carrie uh, Eford, as well as Debbie Eford, are going to be here as well, uh, also providing uh, testimonies. Um, I believe that um, the way it works is that uh, the men are going to be here, right, Rabbi? I believe so, in this room. The men will be here. Next door, there's a fellowship hall next door over at the uh, other uh, side of the Methodist Church. That's where the women will be. And then we'll come together for lunch, and then afterwards, we'll have a combined service um, after lunch. So we're gonna have some good food. Um, I heard the, the cook is great. Um, so, <laughs> so come on out, <laughs> but mostly to get fed the spiritual food, amen? Uh, so again, that's tomorrow, July 16th at 10 a.m. Uh, right here. Um, also, uh, we have these events on our uh, website at BethelTempleFellowship.org. While you're there, if you would like to make a tithe and offering, you can click on Donate at the top from any one of 
our uh, web pages and there's a secure portal where you can do that. Um, also, we post our events there as well as Facebook and on Instagram. And during the week, I want to encourage each and every one of you. If you see something posted from Bethel Temple Fellowship, a Bible works, an event, or something of that, take that and don't just, just hit like so that we can see the thumbs up or the little heart. I can't do it with this microphone. But also hit share and share it with your friends. Share it so that they know what's going on here, the ministry here, and give them that encouraging word of God. Amen. So, again, we have that posted. This video tonight will also be uploaded to YouTube. So we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and, of course, our own website. So thank you so much. And keep in mind, keep in mind, after this men's and women's conference, it won't be long before the fall feast will be around the corner. Amen? Take care. And God bless. Amen. Again, I want to tell everybody that we thank you for joining us and uh, unite in prayer with us. And we thank uh, everybody here and on Facebook and let you know that we are praying for you. And if you have any prayer requests, let us know. That's that's what we do. We have a prayer line that people call also for prayer. So thank you again. We love you. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.